Hello and welcome back to video 8 for topic 3 hardware and this time we're going to be looking at sensors. This is for the IGCC and O-level computer science course. So sensors and their use in control and monitoring systems. So first of all what is a sensor? A sensor is a kind of input device which reads or measures the physical properties from its surroundings. Examples of sensors might include temperature, pressure, acidity, level sensors and light sensors but there are many more which we'll cover in this video. We've got a guy here running around obviously underneath a motion sensor which will detect any kind of movement um, underneath it. So here we go we've listed most of the sensors that are covered in the syllabus. So first of all temperature. A temperature sensor is a sensor which measures temperature and changes in temperature of its surroundings. We might see it used in the control of central heating systems control and monitoring of a chemical process and possibly the control and monitoring of the temperature inside a greenhouse where we're growing plants and fruit and vegetables. Um, moisture sensors. This is a kind of sensor used to gauge the volumetric content of water usually in something like soil. Again control monitor moisture levels in soil, in a greenhouse maybe, uh, monitor the moisture levels in a food processing factory. Similar we have a humidity sensor used to measure the amount of water vapor in, for example, um, a sample of air based on the conductivity of air changing depending on the amount of water present. Again, monitor humidity levels in a building, monitor humidity levels in a factory making microchips maybe, or monitor controlled humidity in a greenhouse. As you can see, lots of sensors are used in greenhouses. Okay, light sensor. These use photoelectric cells that produce an output in the form of an electric current depending on the brightness of the light. Okay, switching street lights on or off depending on um, light levels. Switching on a car headlights automatically when it gets dark. And we've got two different types of infrared, active and passive. In active, these are invisible beams of infrared radiation um, picked up by a detector. If the beam is broken, then there will be changes in the amount of infrared radiation reaching the sensor. Again, these could be used um, turning on car windscreen wipers automatically when um, rain is detected on the windscreen or in security alarm systems, may, maybe an infrared beam um, detecting an intruder. And passive, these sensors measure the heat radiation given off by an object. For example, the temperature, of, again, of an intruder or the temperature of a fridge. Again, using security alarm systems, maybe detecting body heat, and then monitoring the temperature inside an industrial freezer or a chiller unit. And some more, so I've listed 12, a pressure sensor is a transducer and generates different electric currents depending on the pressure applied. Maybe weighing of lorries at a weighing station or measuring the gas pressure in a nuclear reactor. We have sound and acoustic sensors. These are basically microphones that convert detected sound into electric signals or pulses. Pick up the noise of footsteps in a security system or maybe detecting sound of liquids dripping at a faulty pipe joint. We have pH sensors. These measure the acidity through changes in voltage in, for example, soil again. And again, monitor control acidity levels in the soil of a greenhouse or control acidity levels in a chemical process. We have, and you may have heard of this, proximity sensors. And these sensors detect the presence of a nearby, um, of nearby proximity, a nearby object. Um, detect when a face is close to a mobile phone screen and switches off the screen when held to the ear or if you've heard of Tesla cars maybe you're driving along the road and somebody steps out and the car will detect this and brake accordingly. We have gas sensors and most common ones are oxygen and carbon dioxide sensors. These various methods to detect the gas being monitored and produce outputs that vary with the oxygen or carbon dioxide levels present. Again, used for monitoring pollution levels in the air at an airport, possibly, or monitor oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in a greenhouse or in the home, and monitor oxygen levels in a car exhaust system. And finally, I'm going to include accelerometers, and these are sensors that measure acceleration and motion of an application, i.e. the change in velocity. A piezoelectric cell is used um, whose output varies according to the change in velocity. Well, what does that mean? Well, it could be used in cars to measure rapid deceleration and apply airbags in a crash. Or it could be used simply by mobile phones to change uh, between portrait and landscape mode if you rotate the phone. 
So with this, I'm going to talk about something called an ADC, an analog to digital converter. Physical changes in nature, including temperature, light and pH, change constantly and have no signal discrete value. These changes, therefore, can be described as analog. Analog data gathered by the sensors needs to be converted into digital data in order for it to be understood by a computer or microcontroller. This is usually achieved by an analog to digital converter or known as an ADC. This, de this device converts physical values into discrete digital values. As you can see here, the guy has come back, he's running around under the motion detector. This, this gives us an analog reading. The analog reading then, or the analog information, then needs to go through an ADC to be converted into digital data. Okay, and then this can be read by a microprocessor or a computer system. Okay, what I want to do is have a little bit of a look at some of the control applications um, that use sensors. For example, street lighting. In this example, a microprocessor is used to control the operation of a street light. The street lights have been fitted with a light sensor, which constantly sends data to a microprocessor. The data values sent from the sensor will change according to the weather it is sunny, cloudy, rainy, or in this case, um, nighttime. But how does it work? Not by pulling a handle. So we have the street light, and the street light, the sensor on the street light, yeah, is sending signals to the ADC. Okay, so the light sensor fitted to the street light sends data to the ADC interface. In step two, this changes the data into digital form and sends it to the microprocessor. Okay, in step three, the microprocessor samples the data every minute or at some other frequency rating. It keeps sampling, it keeps checking this data against the data that's stored on the microprocessor. Step four, if the data from the sensor is less than the value stored in the memory, a signal is sent from the microprocessor to the street lamp. Okay, and the lamp is switched on. Um, the lamp stays switched on for maybe 30 minutes before the sensor readings are sampled again. This will prevent the lamp from switching off and on during brief heavy cloudy cover. If it gets really, if it's not dark, but it gets really cloudy and then it gets sunny again, then the street lights might be turning themselves on and off at a constant rate. So we need to prevent that, and this is what this does. Okay, if the data from the sensor is greater than or equal to the value stored in memory, a signal is sent from the microprocessor to the street lamp and the light is switched back off again. Um, similar to before, the lamp stays switched off for 30 minutes before the sensor readings are sampled again. Again, this is preventing the switching off and on during heavy or brief um, cloud cover. So that is how a street light works. Now, in the next one, I'm looking at a traffic junction here. Okay, at the moment it's fairly quiet. The traffic junction is controlled by traffic lights. Okay, and what we need to do is describe how sensors in the road and a microprocessor are used to control the traffic at the junction. The microprocessor is able to change the color sequence of the traffic lights, green for go and red for stop. Okay, so how does it work? Well, number one, Pressure sensors could be built into the four roads at each of the junctions and used to detect vehicles approaching the traffic lights in all directions. The monitoring of the roads would be, continue, would be a continuous process. Okay, Data from these sensors is sent back to the microprocessor Okay, but via an ADC. The number of vehicles approaching each set of traffic lights is then calculated by the microprocessor based on sensor data. This generated data is compared to the data that is stored in the memory on the microprocessor. And then, depending on what traffic is where, instructions are sent by the microprocessor to alter the different traffic light sequences as required. So if there's nobody here, or nobody here, then the street lights could potentially stay on to go in a left and right direction until a car appears. Maybe these are quiet roads. Okay, so that is how it would work for traffic junctions. Again, microprocessor, ADC, and the sensor continuously sending signals um, to be compared with the data that is stored. Okay, that is it for this video. I hope that explains sensors a little bit more. I know some people have been asking um, for this particular video, so I hope that helps. Okay, thank you for watching, thank you for now, and I will see you next time. Please continue to ask questions, leave your comments, hit notifications, and please subscribe. 
And finally, if you wish to buy me a coffee, I'd be truly grateful. Please visit buymeacoffee.com forward slash learning zone. Thank you very much indeed. See you next time. Bye for now.